Well, hello and welcome to this BYOB webinar. So BYOB, bring your own brain. My name is Anne Cook. I'm the Chief Executive of the British Neuroscience Association or the BNA, which is hosting this BYOB programme. Uh, it's today is one of a series of events that we've been holding both yesterday, today and tomorrow as well. And it's all about sharing some of the neuroscience research with people who may not be neuroscientists, although obviously neuroscientists are very welcome as well. And to give some insight into what neuroscience research is all about, what we know about the brain and nervous system and how that research is done. So I think that's about it for me. Um, I am now going to introduce who is taking part today. So I said, we're very privileged to have a research group from the University of Oxford. Tonight, you are going to be hearing from Associate Professor Anna Mitchell and some of her team about their primate work at the Oxford University Department of Experimental Psychology. So Anna and her team are investigating how we learn new information and make decisions. And some of their work involves animal models, including both monkeys and rats. And they also work with humans who have had strokes and stroke or brain damage from a stroke. The other speakers alongside Anna this evening, we have Ms. Rianne Heppenstahl, who is a DPhil student in experimental psychology. Uh, she assesses the welfare of Anna's monkeys, and she also looks after the monkeys for all the other principal, in, principal investigators' monkeys at Oxford, so a very busy job. We have Dr. Brooke Perry, he is doing a postdoctoral position in Anna's lab. There's this brick. Um, and he is leading the monkey neurophysiology recording. And we have Juan Carlos Mendez. Uh, Juan is joining us from Mexico. So hello to Mexico. Thank you for coming. Um, he is another postdoc who is recently in Anna's lab. Um, is now back in Mexico, um, but also working on neurophysiology and continuing to collaborate with the lab in Oxford. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Anna, Brooke, Rianne and Juan to give you a tour behind the scenes of a primate lab. Thank you, Anna. And thank you all for joining us this evening uh, to be able to hear more about what, we, what it's like to be working in a primate neuroscience lab here in Oxford. Tonight, we're going to be telling you more about how and why we study the brains and what we're doing when we're learning. And we're using monkeys and humans, like Anne's already explained. So we'll be sharing some of our latest results with you as well. Firstly, during our presentation, we'll be sharing some videos with you and some data and some animation. Please be assured that the videos and the data that we are showing you have only been collected and filmed during the course of the normal procedures that are taking place for the monkeys when they're going about their experiments on a daily basis. Secondly, the re experimental research that we're conducting in the monkeys and humans is very restricted in the UK by the Home Office. All of us working with the monkeys need to hold our own personal license that authorizes us to conduct the experimental procedures with these animals. We need to sit exams to be able to hold a personal license. We need to maintain our training and we need to keep up to date with the latest developments and refinements for the animals. In addition, our work is authorized by the Home Office project license that I am responsible for. It is a legally binding document that's signed off by the Home Office Secretary of State. At the moment, that's pretty Patel. To apply for a project license, my work is subject to rigorous and extensive reviews and assessments. Neuroscience research involving any animals, but particularly monkeys, will only be approved if no other alternative is available and the animal species is the most appropriate model to be able to study. The named veterinarian surgeon and the named animal welfare officer must approve the initial application before it is also reviewed and approved by the local institution's Animal Care and Ethical Review Committee. Next, the local Home Office Inspector and the subcommittee of the UK Home Office Inspectorate with uh, primate expertise will then review it and pass it back for comments, for clarification or for changes that I need to then make. They provide these assessments directly to the Secretary of State. Finally, I must present the application to the Animal and Science Committee and there are national independent committee that will also advise the Secretary of State. So the final decision to approve this license is signed off by the Home Office. Secretary of State after a very long process, which takes about a year to complete. One of the conditions of any project license is to ensure that the most refined and proven methods are used in the research. My own lab has an interest in refining our training methods and some of the techniques we've used for wound management. And uh, I'll be talking about the training and Brooke will be joining up uh, to talk about the development with the wound management shortly. So thank you very much for your uh, interest. So firstly, refinements and training monkeys. 
Uh, we had our paper published in 2009 in the Journal of Neuroscience, and it effectively shows how training methods, uh, the training methods we use to be able to teach the monkeys to enter primate chairs into the transport boxes to work with neuroscience experiments. We've got some videos here to be able to show you. We don't actually handle the monkeys ourselves. We train them to um, voluntarily enter the, the uh, transport devices in order to be able to get out. So what you can see here is a monkey being moved around by Stuart, uh, the primate trainer in, in our lab. He's wheeling up a transport box to the, to the opening that the monkey will uh, come out of. And he's doing that for a date here. In the video, you can see the date the monkey is coming down and he's learning to be able to come in and he reaches out and he's getting that date in order to be able to use positive reinforcement training uh, for these techniques. So the positive reinforcement is obviously the, the reward that he gets, the, the date or the peanut, and we work out what it is that the monkey's like. We're encouraging them to then um, have a pattern of behavior where they're responding to uh, commands that we're using, voice commands and whistles and clicks, and then they're associating that with receiving a, a reward once they've obviously participated in the behavior. These stages are done in um, small stages uh, and baby steps, moving the animals on so that the monkey and the animal, uh, sorry, the monkey and the trainer succeed every day. Now this is a monkey getting into a primate chair. Uh, these uh, transport devices are obviously designed for different experimental procedures that we need them to do um, and obviously designed to be able to keep the monkey safe and comfortable and also the, the researcher safe um, because obviously the monkeys um, are, are, are essentially wild animals. And then finally, um, the last video here. Once we got them into the transport box and that is done voluntarily, um, and the monkeys are receiving reward, then the monkey in this particular um, example is putting its head up through a neck plate and it's then being yoked into this neck plate so that its head is maintained above the primate chair and this is so that we can get access to the monkey and then also obviously he can see the transport, uh, <clears throat> sorry he can see the touch screens and we're going to get him to respond uh, with his hands reaching through the, the bars and he's getting a peanut uh, reward for that. And then uh, to show you a video of the monkeys having a bath. Oh, there it is there. Um, so they enjoy having their baths. One, this is one of the refinements that we use uh, on a regular basis. They have a wet clean every two weeks at least, and they're coming into the, the baths and jumping around and enjoying it. And they're socially housed animals, and they're looking for treats at the bottom of the bath. It's nice warm water and lots of bubbles for them to play with. What we do when we're um, doing the training, like I said, is we're breaking it down into small steps to be able to ensure that the monkey's succeeding every day. So it's getting rewarded for, for the uh, tasks that it's doing and also the trainer because it can be a very stressful experience for, for both involved. So reducing those down, making it very simple steps um, helps to reduce the stress for the animals and for the trainer. Um, now I'm going to pass you over to Brooke, who will be talking about um, how our labs are using some of these different techniques uh, to be able to assess learning in the primates. Thanks, Brooke. Hello, everyone. So first, I'm just going to go through some of the techniques we use to investigate uh, learning in primates. So one of the first things we do, of course, is cognitive testing. So that will be tests of learning and memory in our case and decision making tasks. We can look at things like physiological parameters, so that might be eye tracking or heart rate changes. We can use neuroimaging, so um, MRI or fMRI. Uh, we can use neurophysiology, which would be recording neural signals in the brain. Uh, we can do perturbations, which would be uh, a, infusing a drug or giving a lesion or microstimulation uh, in targeted structures or regions. And we can also use human um, studies to complement our work in monkeys, where we use stroke patients and um, deep brain stimulation patients. Uh, so cranial implants are required, uh, including head posts, to hold the head still of the monkey during procedures such as MRI, uh, electrophysiology, or the tracking of eye movements. Um, so this is to help ensure the safety of the monkey and the researcher or technicians working with them. So the CAD image below just here uh, shows one of the common types of head posts, this thing here used for MRI studies. So um, 
Cranial implants of any kind require a surgical procedure, uh, and we want to ensure that the healing of the implant site can be as efficient as possible. So we, with some colleagues at Newcastle, developed a head cap that can be fitted over the implants to promote wound healing by reducing the monkey's ability to pick at their wounds. Um, so you can see what that looks like here in the picture, and I've also got the, the real thing here. Uh, so it's just made from a special material they use in um, radiology for um, cancer patients. Uh, and it's easily moldable, so we can adapt it to any cranial implant a monkey might have. Um, and this particular refinement ran, won the design um, award across all species for the Institute of Animal Technology in association of the British pharmaceutical industry. And we've also managed to get this um, published so other researchers can use it too. Uh, so now I'm going to pass over to Rianne when, and she's going to talk to you about some of the primate welfare um, stuff she does. Hi everyone, so just a little bit about how we look at the welfare of some of the primates uh, that are being used in neuroscience research. So researchers generally who are using animals always want to consider and promote the welfare of the animals that they're using. And when we talk about welfare, we're generally talking about the animal's physical health, their mental well-being, and giving them the opportunity to explore natural behaviours. We want to make sure that the welfare of the animals is as good as it possibly can be, because not only is that beneficial for the animal, but it's also beneficial for the science too. So in order to be able to understand how we can improve the welfare, as we always want to and improvements are always ongoing, we need to be able to understand how these animals experience certain situations and be able to actually assess their welfare. Um, unlike in humans, where we normally just ask someone how they were feeling, whether they find something stressful or if they find it pleasant, we can't do that with the animals. So we do have to explore some different methods. So one of the methods which I'm using in my project is to look to basically use activity trackers for monkeys. Uh, so these are very similar to what we use, what you see in humans in the terms of um, smartwatches and Fitbits. So we personally put those on so that we can measure uh, different parameters that assess our personal well-being. So things like our physical activity levels, what behaviours we're doing, and even our sleep patterns. And these are commonly used for animal welfare studies in many species from pets and livestock and also zoo animals. So the way that I use them in the monkeys at Oxford is um, the device we use is an accelerometer, which is this uh, sort of pound coin sized uh, accelerometer device you can see here. And we stitch that inside a soft dog collar, and then we put that around the, the neck of the monkey. And then we use that information to give us some uh, data about the animal's physical activity and the behavior. And the example I'm gonna give you in some data today is an example of how we can look at animal behavior. Uh, particularly in looking at how the behaviour can change in response to a particular event. So before I do that, I'll just show you a couple of videos that show some of the behaviours we can detect using these devices. So this is an example of a grooming behaviour. Um, so this is very often seen in wild animals, and it sort of looks like they're cleaning each other's fur. And although this is one of the reasons they might do this, the actual main reason that we think that primates engage in this behavior is a way to socialize with each other and form strong friendships. So they do this in the wild in order to create better friendships with different individuals. So it's a behavior we tend to like to see in the animals housed in neuroscience facilities. So the next behavior I've got to show you in a video is a foraging behavior. So this is where the animal is sort of searching around through substrate on the floor, looking for food items. So uh, this can be like seeds or grains or nuts. And even though the animals that we have in the facility are provided with all their food that they need, so they don't need to do this behavior to look for food, we still provide this opportunity because it's a natural behavior that seems to have a positive impact on their welfare. So the example I'm gonna give you today is how behavior changes in, a, in one animal in response to a potentially stressful event. So the event I'm going to discuss today is an animal moving room. So basically moving from one house to another. And we all know that that can potentially be a very stressful situation. So in this case, animal, this uh, one animal is moving from room A to room B. And the differences between the two rooms are basically that in room A, so when animals first arrive in the facility at Oxford, they have to undergo a period of quarantine within the facility. 
And that usually lasts uh, a couple of weeks. And it's generally just so in the way that we self isolate and are used to that now, it's just so that if there is any potential infectious diseases, they don't pass it on to the rest of the animal colony. So the, diff the main difference between room A and room B is simply the number of animals housed in that room. So the cage sizes are all the same um, and the enrichment that provided is all the same. But essentially, when you move to room B, you're gaining a lot more neighbours than you previously had. So what, just to explain what you can see in the pie chart, so there's five different behaviours that you can see here. So there is a general locomotion behaviour, which is uh, how the animal walks and climbs around the cage. There's a rapid movement, which is this blue behaviour, and that is uh, running and jumping around the cage. There's an inactive behaviour, so that's when the animal is sat still and not really engaging in any other behaviours. Also might be uh, that the animal is sleeping, so that's this orange one. Uh, active rest behaviours, which is this pink uh, portion, and that is the behaviours that I've showed you in the, um, in the video, so such as foraging and grooming. And then we also have pacing behaviours. So now pacing behaviours are an extremely important thing to assess when thinking about the welfare of animals. Uh, because it's not something that's generally done in the wild, uh, but we do see it in captivity, and it's often thought to have some sort of negative welfare implication. So, for example, uh, you might feel um, when you're on the phone to your boss in a very stressful situation, you might end up pacing up and down the room, and it's a very similar um, behaviour that we see in the primates as well. So what we actually see in the data here is that when the animal moved from room A to room B, we actually saw an increase in active rest type behaviours, so these were these uh, more socialisation and foraging behaviours, and a decrease in inactivity and not much change in the other behaviours. And this is actually quite a promising finding because it shows that the, the, the behaviours that have increased are generally indicative of a more positive welfare state. And so this is why one of the main reasons that we house animals in these situations is that we want them to have these more socialised op uh, socialisation opportunities because it gives them uh, a better overall welfare. And we didn't, in this instance, detect that the animal was stressed by the move itself. So I think that's it for welfare for now. Um, now there's gonna be a short animation video about why we use animals in neuroscience research. Our brain weighs just one and a half kilograms, and yet it does everything. Sensing, thinking, moving, feeling, remembering, and much more. The brain is like 100 billion tiny computers, brain cells, or neurons, each connected to thousands of others. These connections would stretch four times around the Earth. Your brain works at lightning speed. It takes one-tenth of a second to fully analyze a visual image. The brain needs energy to function properly, around 20% of what you eat. We need to study the brain to understand how it works. Brain imaging is useful, but scientists also need other methods. Brain cells can be studied in a dish but this doesn't tell us how the brain affects behavior and these cells cannot form the complex connections of a living brain. Computer models can also be used, but they are no substitute for the real thing. Studying animal brains is hugely helpful for understanding our own brains. Lots of different animals can be used, from fruit flies to mice, rats and monkeys. Each animal model has its own advantages and most of what we know about the brain comes from animal studies. It's important that we continue to improve our understanding of the brain so that we can help treat brain diseases, answer questions on everyday functions such as recognition and memory, and learn about other things the brain affects. For example, why we dream and how sleep aids memory, how the brain controls how hungry you get and what you eat, why you get depressed, and how drugs affect brain chemistry and cause addiction. Understanding the brain can even help paralyze patients walk or talk again. Okay, now we're going to pass it over to Juan Carlos. So we're just going to stop sharing our screen and he'll join with us. Hello everyone. Um, I'm now going to start sharing my screen. Uh, 
Okay. Um, well, one thing that um, I want to explain um, now that we are going to start uh, dealing with, with what we do in the lab um, is one key aspect that, that um, we see in neuroscience is that we are now treating the brain as a collection of different networks. So I think we are all familiar with the notion that the brain has different specialized areas. Um, and, and this is still valid, like as you can see in, in this slide, there's areas that are uh, dealing with movement, with higher mental functions, with sensation and so on. Um, and as I, say, as I say, this is still valid, but um, really uh, how neuroscientists are seeing the brain more and more is that the, these areas on their own, they really can't do much. It's through their interaction um, as networks that they really can uh, achieve uh, what the brain is capable of. Um, so to, to study what we study uh, and uh, the lab, and as lab is mostly concerned with um, learning and memory, how learning and memory is achieved by the brain. So to study this, we first need to understand which areas uh, are uh, dealing with these aspects and, and how they become interconnected. So I see this aspect of the brain uh, very similar to a human society, actually. So we have uh, human beings that are specialized for different tasks and areas, like we have engineers, we have musicians, teachers, and so on. But again, they wouldn't be able to do much on their own. It's really through interactions that society works. So this engineer can cooperate with business people and construction workers to build houses or bridges. But he also um, helps his partner to raise their child. Um, so these interactions are really what are shaping society and the same happens in the brain. There are key areas, for example, that, that um, some areas will need to connect at some point, like a doctor, everyone in society will need a doctor at some point. So the same happens in the brain. Um, for example, um, take for example the engineer on his own and the doctor on her own might uh, not achieve much, but if they cooperate, um, they can create new technologies like, uh, like MRI. Um, so one way to study um, how society works might be, uh, and I will show you how this relates to the brain, um, we might, for example, give a boost to a member of society. We can give a boost to the engineer and perhaps then um, all, uh, not all, sorry, other areas of, of society will have a boost just because the engineer is, is now working more. Um, so we can do the same with the brain. Uh, what we do is that we train monkeys to perform different tasks inside an MRI scanner and this scanner can um, show us which areas of the brain are active. And uh, by analogy with, with the boost to the engineer, we can then pharmacologically give a boost to a specific area. Say that we give a, a transient boost to the area here in, in this brain. And we might then see, thanks to the MRI, that other areas start having also uh, a boost. Uh, some might have a greater boost, others lesser boost, or others might not even um, have any changes. So these would suggest that these two areas are particularly interconnected. The, the one that received the boost and the one that also then showed an increase in activity. So that's a starting point uh, to then see if we are going to then go and study a particular area as related to learning and memory, um, which changes we might be expecting in other areas. So now I'm going to show you a small video of how we actually do this. So what we have here is a monkey inside a primate chair 
So he's trained to, um, to be comfortably seated in, in that chair, uh, go into the MRI scanner, and then perform a task in, in scythe. So what you're seeing here as well is, you can see that tiny blue dot moving around. That is actually the gaze of the monkey. The, monkey is, um, the, the monkey's eyes are being tracked. So we can see where the monkey is seeing. And with his sight, he is uh, indicating to us um, the, the responses to some cognitive tasks. That is activating these specific areas, giving us a clue of where we should go uh, and, and search further. Um, so then, um, here is an example f uh, of, of the kind of results that we get. For example, if we give a boost to this area of the thalamus, we can see that other areas then increase uh, their activity as well. So this, this is giving us a hint of the areas that we need to uh, be looking, that, that we need to be studying, that might be uh, particularly uh, important for learning and memory uh, and creating these networks that I was telling you about. So now uh, Anna and Brooke are going to um, dig a little bit uh, deeper into uh, what is going on actually in these areas and studying them through neurophysiological techniques. Thanks very much, Juan Carlos. That was great. Um, just changing sharing. Okay, so one of the tasks that uh, my lab has been using um, and previous people in, in Oxford have also used this lab uh, task is the object in place learning task. This is the monkey version. It was developed for monkeys. And this is the monkey version. This is one of the monkeys sitting in the primate chair. His neck is yoked and he's re receiving a smoothie reward through the hose pipe here, um, the smoothie pipe. And we're recording signals from his brain while he's performing this task. And he's reaching out and seeing these colorful screens. And he's working out which of the two typographical characters here will give him a reward, will give him the smoothie reward. Uh, and he's reaching with his hands through the primate chair in order to be able to do this. And obviously we're recording the neural signals in the brain and Brock will tell you a wee bit about that in, in, a, in a minute. Uh, we've also developed this task to be able to run in humans. Previous people have also run this in humans, looking at different areas of the brain after neurosurgery. We're looking at uh, the effects in the thalamus after people have suffered, unfortunately, from a stroke in the medial dorsal thalamus or in the anterior thalamus. And we're trying to understand how this is affecting their learning because we know from previous work that I've done that uh, brain damage to these areas will cause them to have problems learning in this task. What the monkeys are doing is seeing many of these scenes and they're repeated within the session and we're getting a, a recording of how well they're learning within the session. And then the following day when they come back into the lab or the following week when they come back into the lab, then we show them a whole lot of new scenes and we then repeat those within the session and we're getting an understanding of, of how rapidly they can learn and which ones they're making errors on. And obviously then tying that up to the neural signals that we're recording from the brain. So this is just uh, to show you the, the typographical characters. One of them will be rewarded them, one of them won't, and they've got to learn which one will give them the smoothie reward. And in the human version of the task, because obviously this was developed for monkeys, we've used fractal images instead um, so that they um, find it harder to be able to verbalize and, and don't use your language to be able to solve the task. Um, and as Juan Carlos has already mentioned, uh, we can run uh, the task with the, with the monkeys in it um, in the, inside the scanner and things like that. This is quite a complicated task to be able to run in the scanner. So what we were doing was training the monkeys up and then scanning them at various points while they were learning the task to be able to track how the changes were occurring in the brain as a consequence of them learning in this task. And it's a specific task that we were getting them to do. So we were scanning them before they had ever experienced the task. And once they've reached certain levels of performance criteria as a consequence. So we had an experimental group of animals that were learning this particular task 
And we compared their performance when they had really got very good at it compared with when they had never experienced it before and never seen a computer in their life. And we were comparing them to a group of controls who were learning another task that wasn't rewarded in the same way and didn't have all these uh, visual presentations and comparing them at the same time point. And we found that there were different changes in the brain as a consequence of this. And like uh, Juan Carlos has already mentioned, uh, these are neural networks that are in the brain that are, that are changing as a consequence. And we had a priori hypotheses about particular areas that we were looking at, but also uh, looking at whole, whole brain connectivity to see what else was going on. So we were able to find uh, connectivity between areas, the medial dorsal thalamus, as, as Juan Carlos has already said, and interconnected regions in the anterior cingulate, orbital frontal cortex, and ventral premotor cortex, and also other areas that are involved in object and place scene learning in the retrospinal cortex and in the cervicular complex and perirhinal cortex. And this was just published late last year in the Journal of Neuroscience. So what do these results mean then? What, what they show us then is that understanding how neural networks change as a consequence of learning this cognitive information. Some areas of the brain increase in their plasticity as a consequence of learning in this task and some areas decrease as a consequence of learning. What we found is that the, the studies in the monkeys were very similar for the humans. The frontotemporal connectivity and these cortical areas was interacting together when they were learning. And for the first time, uh, excitingly, we were able to show that these subcortical areas, especially in the medial dorsal thalamus um, nuclei, were interacting with cortical areas as a consequence of this rapid new learning that, they were, that the monkeys were experiencing. So uh, now I'm going to pass it over to Brock because we have the, the data to show that this task is particularly important and these neural networks are involved. Brock will be telling you what we're working on currently in the lab now. Thank you. Yes, no worries. Okay, so you've seen that one way we can measure activity in the brain is to use fMRI. Uh, another method we might use is electrophysiology. Um, so that's just recording electrical signals from the brain. So electrophysiology complements fMRI nicely as fMRI is great for showing us where something is happening in the brain, but not so good at telling us exactly when it happened. So electrophysiology allows us to see what individual neurons or groups of neurons are doing during a learning task and how that might change over time. So neurons use electrical signals to communicate and these are called action potentials. And we can use special electrodes and recording equipment to capture these signals while learning is occurring. Um, so this here is just an example of one of these electrodes. This is a, a linear array, which just means that it's got multiple electro electrode contacts in a line uh, and then there's the actual size there as compared to a 1p piece. Um, so just as an analogy of, of what we're doing here, it's the same idea as, as us wanting to hear an individual conversation taking place in a crowd. So we might do this by placing one or more microphones close to the people we're interested in listening to, um, to record and to capture the conversations that are going on. Okay, so what do these traces look like? So the recordings we make look something like the blue and black traces you can see here. So the little vertical lines coming underneath the black line and both sides of the blue line here are neurons firing. And then the thicker horizontal line in the middle is um, background activity and noise. And then the waveforms you can see down here underneath are what some of the vertical look, lines look like when we zoom in. So what these are showing is that when a uh, threshold of excitation is reached by the cell, uh, an action potential occurs. And then the electrical charge changes uh, rapidly, rapidly and temporarily before going back to its baseline level. Um, so we, we can record multiple individual neurons on the same electrode. So we can use different factors such as the shape of the waveform to tell one neuron from another, just like in our crowd recording example, it'd be like using the characteristics of someone's voice, such as the tone or the volume to tell how many people are involved in our recorded conversation and who said what. Um, so you can see just from these few examples here that even neurons recorded from the same area can vary quite a bit in, in amplitude and waveform shape. 
so now if we put together uh, all this together, we can look at what individual neurons do during different points in learning in our task. Uh, so the data here is from uh, correct trials on the task that Anna showed you previously. Uh, and if we look at this first plot here, we have trials up the side here, uh, and then a whole bunch of little dots. Um, and these dots are just showing when the neurons fired. Uh, but it's probably easier if we look at this line graph down the bottom here. Um, so we can see that in this particular neuron, the, the activity ramps up as the time to reward approaches. So this cell is particularly interested in reward occurring. Uh, and then we have a different example here of a neuron that's interested in the, the time the monkey touches the screen and the time the monkey gets rewarded. So essentially what we do is we build up a population of all these cells and look at their different firing characteristics and what they are tuned to. And then we can try and extrapolate and um, get an idea of what this region is doing during our task. Uh, so what would we like to know, uh, want to know, well, why, why do we want to know how we learn? Um, so we want to investigate how the brain changes during learning and to help us identify neural networks and understand the contributions of specific brain areas. Causal manipulations we, we can do, such as stimulation, allow understanding of how a ne neural network changes and adapts. And then when we identify relevant neural networks and structures, they might provide effective treatment targets in many brain diseases that affect learning and memory in humans. So now I'm just going to pass it back to Anna so she can um, thank all our kind help and um, sponsors. And yeah, here's Anna for you. Thanks, Brooke. So, so lastly, uh, apart from thanking Rianne and Brooke and Juan Carlos and the BNA, we need to acknowledge the help of uh, Dr. Caroline Bergman, who's uh, Rianne's uh, primary supervisor for her PhD, and uh, Mr. Stuart Mason, who's also our primate trainer in the lab and couldn't join us tonight. Um, and the main funding that I have for the research that we're doing at the moment, the neurophysiology and neuroimaging, is coming from the Wellcome Trust. We've also received Medical Research Council funding uh, in the past, and Rianne is supported by the UKRI uh, BBSRC. Uh, and last but not least, obviously, we need to thank the monkeys uh, and the contribution that they make to this part of the research program that I run here at Oxford. Thank you all very much. Now, uh, we are going to run another few questions in the poll. So we'd really appreciate you uh, contributing anonymous, anonymously again to that poll so that we can get a wee bit of an understanding of the, of the presentation. Thank you, everybody. That's wonderful. Um, thank you all very much for those presentations. Uh, we are now going to move into uh, the Q&A. We've got lots of fantastic questions. Can I just ask Anna, Brooke and Rianne, I think you've covered up your camera. Um, we can hear you fine, but we can't see you. Ah, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. So don't worry, we can see all your slides. Um, so we have got lots of questions here. Just to let you know, you can actually vote for questions. So if there are ones that you see up there you particularly like answered, um, then please vote for them. I've also got lots of questions, but I'm going to focus on the audience ones. Um, so right at the top, a question about the MRI scanner. Is the MRI scanner loud and how do the monkeys react to the noise? Juan Carlos, would you be able to answer that one for us? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, well, the quick answer is yes, the, the MRI scanner is quite loud uh, and it's the same basically that um, is used for humans as well. So one thing we do is that we actually have a recording of, uh, of the noise that the MRI scanner does and we train the monkeys gradually to get used to it. So um, initially we train them in a fake scanner to, uh, just for them to get used to be working comfortably and uh, we play in the background this this noise uh, and gradually we increase the volume uh, so that then the monkeys uh, are actually quite comfortable when when they go to the actual 
real scanner. Thank you, that's an excellent answer. Does anyone else want to comment or shall I um, move on? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, lovely, so there's, a, there's another one which has been voted, so I'm gonna go straight to that one. Um, kind of two parts to this, how many years are individual primates used in research and what happens to them once they're no longer needed? And then second part to it, how do they respond to new environments outside of those that they were used to whilst used in research? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so the project license lasts for five years in the UK and you have to apply to get it renewed. Um, it may be possible to have some of the monkeys uh, transferred onto the new project license. Uh, so they could go on for an, another extended period of time, but uh, there's lots of checks and balances in place. So before we do any procedure, uh, everything about the health and welfare of the animal has to be signed off by the vet and the NACRO. So the, the named vet and the NACRO means the named animal welfare officer. So they're responsible as legal people. So um, uh, potentially we have to make decisions about uh, continuing animals all the time on a regular basis and obviously make sure that they're well enough to do that in the first place. Uh, so typically on my license, uh, we would have the animals around for about five years, between four and five years. And uh, at the end, we uh, make the most of the monkey, we perfuse the monkey and we uh, do uh, ex vivo work on the brain of the animal. We need to identify where we've been targeting the neurons, for example, to make sure that we had them in the right place, which uh, fortunately we do. We do that while the monkey's still alive with MRI, but we need to do the final um, work as well to be able to uh, include the histology. Uh, we may have done manipulation. So again, we would need to know where those were we can do uh, different kinds of staining to be able to understand what's going on in terms of neural connections in the brain and um, understand where the connections are going to these different areas and and the and the um, and that's the gold standard technique so we can use the mri scanner to be able to help us with those things but then we need the the actual physical brain at the end to be able to work on as well so and the rest of the animal is also shared there's a network network of people across europe uh, where other people want different parts of the animal as well, and those are, uh, are organised through the, the uh, vets and the, and the welfare officers to be able to make sure that that animal is, is made the most of. So all of the animals in the UK are, are put down at the end of the, the neuroscience experiments. It can be different in different countries in the EU, but certainly here in the UK, that is the policy of the Home Office. And we must... I mean, that, that, that links very much with the, the three R's. I don't know how many people who are listening are familiar with the three R's, but that's a key kind of tenet of animal research, isn't it? And one of those R's is to reduce. And I suppose if you're making the most of a, a single animal in that way that you said that you, you share with other groups and you, and you really follow all the way through all those research stages, then you're reducing the overall the number of animals that you'll be using. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. You want to answer a little bit about the welfare of the environments? Or... Yeah, okay. Um, and just to say, in terms of different environments, that uh, uh, when they come from the breeding centre, um, Rianne was talking about them moving. So those two animals had come from the breeding centre, gone into quarantine in the primate facility here in Oxford, and then moved into the other part of the housing area that obviously isn't in quarantine. So that's the only times that the monkeys are experiencing these new environments. Um, and, and we are monitoring that and that's part of uh, Rian's overall PhD in terms of looking at that. So um, uh, we'll get better understanding of that when, when she's coming through and finishing. But at the moment, do you want to make any comments about that? Or? Um, I'm not, the tricky thing is, I guess, when they first come into the facility, um, obviously, we do want to monitor their welfare, but we also want to give them time to adapt. So we don't want to be going in and doing too many manipulations and interrupting them. We want to give them that time to habituate to the environment and get used to this new situation. Um, they are different cages than the breeding facility. It is a completely different uh, setting for them. And also they've, also, they've just experienced when they very first get there, uh, a transport period. So they don't necessarily transport uh, transport for very far it's not so days or anything but even a few hours in transport can be quite stressful for animals so it's important to uh, give them time to get used to things without giving them too much uh, interference but we do try and collect some welfare measures if we can to see how the change is affected. Thank you very much and, and good luck with the, the PhD. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so there's more questions up here. There's a really interesting one. Does the sex of a monkey matter while doing the research? So I guess there's the differences between male and female. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we work with both uh, males and females um, and, uh, and it's possible to work with both males and females. Typically, uh, we do want to have more of the females available for breeding. Um, back in uh, the, the breeding centre in the UK. We have our own breeding centre here in the UK. So we do tend to get more of the males to be able to use in the experiments, but, but generally speaking, we have some females around as well. And no, uh, uh, it's obviously uh, experimentally done uh, to be able to work through and, and make sure that we understand what is going on in a particular animal. We don't have a huge number of animals and we design the experiments to be typically within, uh, within species sorry, within subject animals. So we get an understanding of what their baseline performance is like, and then what's happening as a consequence of them having learned the task, for example, um, after certain manipulations, they may receive drugs, they may um, receive microstimulation, for example. Um, and then we're recording from them again in the same animal, but just on different occasions. So we have an understanding of, of their changes uh, within that animal. Um, so we don't tend to go across groups very much. If we are going across groups, then we do it as percentages. We don't see uh, typically differences between the males and females and the type of work that we're doing, but we do make sure it's more within animal that we see it uh, changes. So some animals are just clever, like, like some you know, humans are more clever than others, and some need extra help and support, and we are able to manipulate the tasks so that they're all still performing at the level where they can achieve and, and get the results. Um, so they're achieving on a, on a daily basis and getting the rewards. With the, with the neurophysiology, we don't need them to be doing 100%. We really only need them to be doing about seven, between 70 and 80%. Because while we look at the correct trials, we also need to look at incorrect trials. And we need some variability in the data so we can see how the brain is responding when, we're doing, when they're doing things correctly and when they're not doing things correctly. Mm -hmm. So, so we, need, we need variability and we, we don't necessarily see any difference between, between the sexes of the animals in that sense. Well, that's really interesting, especially, I mean, there's quite an active discussion about the number of male animals used in rats, isn't there, for, for research and whether that's relevant for, for females. So, that's interesting to know that actually it's, it's not the case in, in primate research. Well, sorry, just in the, in the work that I'm talking about. So we know, we know obviously that there are uh, gender differences and, and sex differences and, and certain types of, of, you know, for example, social neuroscience or things like that, um, stress research and other things. But, but specifically for what we're doing in this learning task is what I'm talking about. So I wouldn't want to talk about this and make it general for, for them all. I'm just talking about in the learning task. So, okay. sorry, sorry, just to clarify. Yeah. Um, so uh, a question right at the top, which brain area is least understood compared to the others? That's a really interesting question. Maybe, um, you know, not <laughs> disconnected from the fact that all brain areas are connected to each other. Um, but uh, your thoughts on that one? Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's tricky in a way. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, we could argue that the hippocampus is probably the, the, the most researched, so we would have to argue that that's the one that people understand the most about, but people can still find a lot of new and, and, and exciting information about the hippocampus. So I would say pretty much everywhere in the brain is, is the least understood. We don't, we don't have the answers yet, and we've got a long way to go before we get them. So, but we're, we're working on it in, 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 in little steps, and, and yeah, we'll get there in the end, definitely. Um, um, but my favorite area is the thalamus. And okay. yeah, so <laughs> there's still a lot definitely in terms of how that interacts with, with other areas of the brain to be able to understand as well. And a lot of the things that we're finding out, obviously nobody had known before in, in, in the last couple of years, three years, four years, five years ago. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, Juan, you look like you. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure, if I, if I can just add that, um, I think very broadly, the brain has been subdivided into three great aspects. And one is the sensory aspects, like areas concerned mainly with uh, vision, hearing, smell, and so on. Um, areas that are concerned with uh, controlling movement. And quite like uh, in the middle would be uh, areas that are more concerned with cognition, emotion, uh, rational thinking, memory, 
Um, and I would say, I would argue that uh, the first two, sensory and motor, are now a little bit better understood. Uh, and an example of that is the, the new and exciting uh, tools and technologies that we are seeing that are coming out to control prosthesis, for example, uh, prosthetic arms and legs and, and so on. But the association areas, the ones that are concerned with memory, emotion, uh, thinking, are the ones that I, I would say, and as Anna was saying, one of them is the hippocampus, uh, are, are not very well understood. Um, and so this would be like the posterior parietal cortex and the prefrontal cortex. Um, those, are, those are key areas for, for this kind of cognitive abilities. Thank you. Um, Thanks, we're sir. racing to the end, so I'm going to try and squeeze in as many questions as possible and maybe bring two slightly together. So one really key question uh, for this type of research, uh, if these types of research are safe for primates, why do we not just use humans, which is an interesting one. And slightly tying in is um, how is the extrapolation from primates corroborated for us as humans? Like how do you know that the results you see in animals occur similarly in humans. So different questions, but kind of related. Um, if I could ask you to tackle that one. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so the first one, uh, in terms of if it's safe in primates, why not in humans? Uh, why not just use humans? So so we do use humans, um, uh, but but they are, the humans that we use have already had a stroke um, and we have controls um, and we compare between the two groups. And so, we, we are able to use the same task, like I've told you, but we have just developed it slightly differently, but that we found out doesn't seem to make a difference between the monkeys and the humans. If anything, the humans find it slightly harder because they're not getting smoothie reward. Um, but um, it's not possible to then do the manipulations that we do in the primates in order to be able to then understand how these areas are, are causally involved in the learning and the memory and also in decision-making. I haven't talked about decision-making today, but that's the other part of the, of the work that we do. Uh, so so it's, it, it is possible to do some of this work in humans. And like I said, we do, we, we, we have many avenues to be able to address these questions, uh, but, but we need to be able to have the primates to be able to address certain things and to be able to apply the perturbations in order to be able to get the causal explanations of what's going on in the system, the consequence. Um, and then the other part was about the corroboration, how, how similar are they? Mm. So that is part of the reason why we are using non-human primates for some of this research. Uh, the monkeys are very clever. These are highly cognitive tasks. They have, monkeys have a prefrontal cortex and what we're interested in is how the thalamus is interacting with the prefrontal cortex, how the prefrontal cortex is act, interacting with the medial temporal lobes as a consequence. So it's a, it's a trisynaptic loop if you can think about it, but there's obviously other inputs coming in from the from the periphery and, and coming in from the from the um, brainstem and midbrain regions that are influencing this as well. Rats and mice don't have a prefrontal cortex in the same way that a human does. So I have to justify the reasons why we need the monkeys for these particular experiments. And we're trying to understand how these areas of the brain, they're, they're the granular areas of the frontal cortex are involved in these higher cognitive processes that allow us to, to, to be able to learn, to be able to um, form memories, to be able to recall that information updated as time's going on, on the fly in terms of the kinds of things that we're talking about now, make adaptive decisions as a consequence of what's going on. Those are the kinds of things that monkeys can do, humans can do them very, very well. And humans, when they start to have neurodegeneration or, or uh, brain diseases, schizophrenia, for example, uh, ADHD, these areas affect that prefrontal area that, that, is, that is specific to humans. And, and there are similar areas, homologous areas or, or semi-homologous areas in the non-human primate. So some of this research, like I've said, we can justify it because it's, it's needing to be able to understand these particular areas of the brain that aren't available in other species. And these macaque monkeys, there are a particular type of monkey, macaque monkeys, old world monkeys, and they're the one that we are able to use that is most similar to the human brain. Um, great ape research was banned in, in the UK and, and, and lots of other areas of the world, um, certainly in the UK back in the 90s. So it's not possible to use any higher sentient species than, than these macaque monkeys. Mm -hmm. So they're the most similar to humans that, that the research yes, can love. Yes. 
Um, I would like to, to mention that that comment about, you know, why not use humans? Um, I'm going to spring this on my colleagues behind the scenes, if they could put a link to uh, the Understanding Animal Research website, because they, I know they have some interesting articles uh, that covers that point. Um, so if you are interested in, in reading further, then, then I'd encourage you to look at that. Um, very little time left. Uh, so thank you for this excellent seminar. Um, do you think these experimental conditions are affecting these highly intelligent animals' results in a very corruptive way, especially for the behavioural experiments? So we have to be uh, pretty sure that the animals aren't stressed because obviously uh, it's, it, the stress could impact on the quality of the science. Uh, we're very fortunate here at Oxford to have a great team of people who, are, who we engage with all the time and Rianne's involved with all of that side of it. Uh, and, and we're making sure that, that these um, experiments aren't impacting on the stress. Um, I've uh, worked with colleagues all around the world and, and, and combined together, we're gathering evidence to be able to understand cortisol levels, how their heart rate changes, how their physiological properties change as a consequence of this, of this research. We don't have all of the answers yet, so we don't know, nobody's been collecting this kind of evidence, and that's some of the things, the Wellcome Trust is supportive of that, the UKRI is supportive of those things. We need more funders involved and in, um, more governments around the world to be able to understand this, and um, we, we expect it has some kind of effect, but Rianne, uh, she hasn't spoke about that today, but she is showing that, that the, the impact of the anesthesia and things like that doesn't actually have a long-term impact on, on the animals. Um, we know across different days that, that the monkeys perform in very similar ways. Um, we obviously are capturing those kinds of things on a longitudinal uh, scale so we can understand. And typically we don't see that there's changes in their behavior as a consequence of, of them being involved in these experiments. If there was, then we would be going in and exploring why that may be the case. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I am gonna have to just choose one last question. I apologize for all those that that are still up here, but I think a very good one to finish on might be, do you think that at some point in the future, research on primates would be exhausted and come to an end? Uh, I suppose, do, do you see a future where we don't have to do research on, on primates or there might be alternatives or, you know, we, we just don't use that type of research anymore? I think it would be a very sad day if there wasn't the option to be able to have monkey research. It needs to be available for certain things. It wasn't possible to develop the coronavirus vaccine if we didn't have monkeys. Um, it's so important that monkeys are allowed to be used in research. It's just, it would be so detrimental to the, to the health of humans, to the health of animals around the world. So I wouldn't like to see a time when that would be the case. The regulation needs to be there. The refinements need to be there, but it should never be that monkeys would be replaced. The justification for the use absolutely needs to be ensured, but it should always be an option that monkeys are available to be used in research. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We have, we have very passionate about that. Um, and I've written recent papers about that. Um, so if people wanted to look up, um, yeah. I, they're available on my website that was sent at the start with the link of when you were registering. Yeah. It's an important, it's such an important thing in terms of these, these um, neuroscience experiments, but biomedical research mm -hmm. in general needs to continue as a consequence, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. So yes, if you, if you have your you're joining email or it's still up on our website as well. There are links to Anna's website, so you can check that out. We have reached the end of the hour. I'd just like to give the others that aren't opportunity if they wanted to, to comment at all on, on that last point um, of whether whether they see that there will be a, a, a an end to research on, on non-human primates or anything else that's come on in the discussion. Or you can <laughs> smile and wave, no pressure. <laughs> smile and wave, there's Brooke smiling and wave. <laughs> There's Rianne. And thanks, Juan Carlos in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you so much for coming as well. I um, apologise we won't go to all the questions, but I hope that that sort of answered some of your curiosity about what goes on behind the scenes of a primate lab. Um, we'll send the questions on to Anna and her team afterwards. Uh, I'm sure they'll be interested to know uh, what people are interested in and, and what they'd like to know maybe in future events. Speaking yeah. of which, we do have another two BYOB events to come. Uh, we've got two tomorrow. Again, I think my colleagues are putting links in the chat. Um, we've got one on the sensational brain tomorrow afternoon. And then rounding off, we have Claudia Hammond from the BBC talking about the art and neuroscience of rest. 
um, which we think we all need by a Friday evening. Uh, so I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope that you'd like to stay in touch with the BNA and what we're doing. Um, we do have various membership options, always open to having you join us at the BNA. But finally, a huge thank you to our speakers uh, for going out their way and spending their time preparing and presenting this evening's fantastic session. So thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anne, and the BNA. Cheers. Bye then. Bye. Bye. Bye.